Hello and welcome to, I think this is episode 48 of Mad Knitting. My name is Susan, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I created this YouTube channel so that I would have a place on the internet to talk on and on about my crafting life, um, as well as other things that come to mind, but that's mostly knitting these days. Um, I am coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin. It is a very wet and dark and gloomy day here, so I have lights on, otherwise everything would just show up as a dark shadow. Um, apologies if it's a little bit on the yellow side. Um, today is October 26, 2023. It's a Thursday. And um, here we are. It's been... I feel like every time I sit down to record, I want to say it's been a real rough week in the news because it feels like every week it is a really rough week in the news. And today, today it feels especially heavy. Um, global news, national news, uh, fiber news, what happened with wool and folk last weekend. I was not there. I've never been to Rhinebeck or any of the other satellite events, but I've sure been reading about um, what went on at that particular event and how uh, difficult and devastating it was for everyone there. I think it's a damn miracle there wasn't a fire or a stampede, to be honest, from the sounds of it. Um, and um, once again today, I will be calling my elected representatives and advocating for immediate ceasefire in the Middle East and for gun control. I feel like I make these calls. I don't know if anybody's actually listening, but I still have to do it. Um, it's hard to see all these horrible things happening, to know that my tax dollars are going to support things that contribute to humanitarian crises and to violence um, and to and that my tax dollars are not going to support things that actually improve health and safety of American people and of people abroad. Um, and it's it's kind of a helpless feeling to be honest. Um, but I do what I can. I do what I can in my sphere of control and I vote. And I do reach out to my elected officials sometimes um, when I'm feeling especially strongly about something and I suppose that's what I can do. And I, I work a lot locally and advocate locally for, for other things. Anyway, that's my soapbox. Um, that's what's on my mind. But um, one thing I can do that keeps me grounded and keeps me centered and allows me to be a part of a community and contribute things to people that I love and to this community that I love is to knit and make things. That's one thing I do. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and if you are also having a hard time every time you look at the news or hear about the next horrible person who's been elected to a leadership position or horrible thing that's happened, um, you know, some mass shooting or bombing or next level of a humanitarian crisis, just know that a lot of us feel the same way, even if we don't always say things about it online. All right. Um, okay, what else should I say to introduce myself? Like I said, I live in Madison, Wisconsin with my family, uh, my husband and my two teenage children. I work full time for a nonprofit, but I work from home and I am lucky to have a flexible schedule. So as long as I'm getting my work done and I get to all of my meetings, I can carve out pieces of time in the middle of the day sometimes to record these videos. Um, work has been a little bit busier lately, so it's been a little harder for me to find time to do this. Um, but I'm still, I still try, I still do it because this is how I stay connected. Um, I have three hours straight of Zoom meetings this afternoon and I just wanted, and I've been doing nothing but email all morning. So I am stepping away from that for just a little bit so that I can dig my hands into some wool and talk about some of that 
with you all before I go back to go back to Zoom. My life is on Zoom, I swear. So I have a few finished things to show you. Um, I've started a lot of stuff. I think I shared some whole bunch of hats and things that I cast on last time. Um, there are sweaters in the works that I would like to have done, but I'm just sort of rolling with things right now. So the first thing I have finished, I actually don't have the ends woven in yet, but it's close enough. I've showed these on my last two episodes, I believe. These are a pair of socks. I will show you both of them. You can see the ends hanging out. And they really are, you know, as bright and um, garishly Christmassy and variegated as you see. And normally that's not my thing, but for socks, I love it. The yarn is from Knit Circus, which is uh, based in Madison, so local to me. Uh, the colorway is called Naughty or Nice Speckle. And you can see it's a bunch of shades of red and green on, a, on an undyed base. Um, the yarn base is called Greatest of Ease, and it's a merino nylon blend, pretty typical sock blend. So I used my normal sock recipe, I guess is what you'd call it. Size one needles, cast on 64 stitches. You can see, I, I always start at the cuff and work from the cuff to the toe. So I have two by two rib, stockinette for everything else, except the heel is eye of partridge heel. So you're alternating slip stitches. Is that showing up? Kind of. Yeah, there we go. With a little bit of a garter edge here. Um, these are made not quite to fit me. I have decided that I want to give these to someone as a holiday present. So they are the same like circumference as my foot, but ever so slightly shorter for a slightly smaller foot. So it feels good to have these done well ahead of the holiday season. So I will hide the ends, tuck these away, and hopefully not forget to give them to the intended recipient. Excuse me. That's finished object number one. The next two finished objects I have, I talked about last time, but I had not even started. So this was like one of those things where I just, I like really wanted to make this thing, cast on, did it, like everything else like went by the wayside. So a year ago, Stephanie Lutvin, who goes by Telly B Knits, um, published a pattern called Boneyard Sweethearts, and it's this hat pattern that has, you can see on this hat, skeletons holding hands, because they're sweethearts, you know, and there's like little ghosties in between on the top and the bottom. And when that pattern went up for sale, I think there was like a really big discount at first, it was like two or three dollars, so I bought it thought I would knit it, didn't get around to it. Um, we started getting closer to Halloween season here and I decided I really, really want to make this hat. So I did some stash diving um, and I think I was sort of trying to decide between some different yarn choices. This is a local Rambouillet fingering weight that I bought at a farmer's market years ago maybe i did show this before anyway it's no longer available the farmer retired um her website doesn't even have doesn't exist anymore when i looked it up it had a broken link um so she raises these sheep she hand dyes the yarn um and it's just delightful so this first hat i made for my daughter who is 15 because um she really liked it and you know, if she likes something I'm gonna knit and will wear it, then I will make it for her. So I made this hat and I used, um, I asked her if she wanted ghosts or hearts because there was an option to do hearts in the pattern. And she wanted the ghosts because the hearts were just maybe a little too, a little too cutesy for her, I think. And um, I used size 
three needles, I think, for the ribbing. And I know I use size four for the color work. And that's important because if you look at it, you can tell that the, the ribbing is kind of slack. It doesn't like pull in nice and tight. And as I was going along with this hat, I thought, this looks like it's kind of big. And I tried it on and like it sits on my head, but if you look, just look at it on me, it is kind of loose. I feel like there's a lot of room in here. Um, I feel like a lot of cold air would come up under here. I have my daughter try it on a few times. I kept asking her if she thought it was too loose because I said, look, this, I mean, I knit this entire hat in one weekend. I started it Saturday morning and I finished it Sunday night last weekend. And I said, if it's too loose, I can rip this out and start over. I don't mind. And she insisted that it was fine. Um, I think her head is actually probably a little bit bigger than mine and she definitely has more hair. So as far as she's concerned, this hat fits fine and is comfortable. Well, I got done with it and I really wanted one for me. I want one of these hats for me. So as soon as I got done with that, I cast on another one. Um, by the way, the pattern is written for fingering weight yarn. The stitch gauge for the color work is seven stitches for one inch. Um, and I'm sure my row gauge did not match the pattern because for both of these, when I got to the end of the color work, I barely did any in the plain rounds before I started decreases. Otherwise it would have been too tall. So I started another hat for myself and I made, I think it comes in three sizes and I made the middle size. So I did the exact, I, I followed the same size, but I went down a needle size for everything. So the ribbing on this one, which is done in a contrast color, because I wanted a contrast color for the brim, same yarn, just dyed this bright red color. Um, I think I used like a size two, maybe a three millimeter or maybe a size one and a half, I don't remember exactly, for that ribbing. And then I used a size three needle, 3.25 millimeter, I think, for the color work. And because this is non-superwash yarn, um, and it's kind of sticky, like it's very soft. Rambouillet is soft like merino, but a little more robust, maybe? Um, anyway, it sticks very nicely to itself. It's very good for color work. Um, it worked just as well on those different needle sizes. And wouldn't you know, this one fits me a little better. It's just a little bit snugger. Um, I don't feel that gap so much when I put it on. I like the contrast brim. I asked my daughter if she wanted a contrast brim. She said no, so that's what I did for the one for me. And if you'll notice, I decided to go with the hearts. I just went full on cute. It's not kitschy. I think it's a little too classy to be kitschy, but a full on cute Halloween embracing the sweethearts theme with this hat. And I'm very happy with it. I haven't worn it yet because we've had a freakishly warm week. It was like uh, up in the 70s Fahrenheit the other day and it's still, like I, we turned off the heat, I still don't have it on. I'm actually a little too warm in my thrifted sweater here that I'm wearing. Um, but it will cool off considerably by the weekend. So I might wear this over the weekend. A friend of mine wants to go on a hike, a Halloween hike. So I might wear this when we go. Um, in fact, side note, my older child, my son, um, who is a senior in high school is taking his last PE credit this semester and they have a camping trip scheduled for next week and the day, the second day of the trip, it's supposed to snow about an inch. <laughs> so we'll see how those kids do out there. Um, it's a risk you take if you go camping in Wisconsin at the end of October. It could be 80 degrees, it could snow on you unlikely to be something in between, honestly. So those are my finished objects. I have these two hats um, and a pair of socks. I have a lot of works in progress, but I'm only gonna share the ones with you that I have actually made some progress on. 
So let's start with um, the sweaters for my nieces. I feel like totally a broken record. I feel like these are never gonna get done. I think last time, and I haven't made a ton, ton of progress, but just to remind you, I am making the toque sweater or tuck, it's probably toque, by the designer Gabrielle Dansknit for both my nieces. Um, they live out of state. The younger one is five, the older one is seven. And I miss them a whole lot. And so I knit and I make many things for them um, to like compensate for the fact that I don't get to see them very often. So I think I showed this one last time where where I had it all, like I haven't, I still haven't blocked this or hidden the ends, but you can kind of get an idea of what the sweater, what's going on with the sweater. It's, you knit it top down or neck down. It's a cardigan with raglan shaping um, and a hood, obviously. I chose to pick up stitches for the button band after everything else was done because I thought it would make a nice edge to go along these stripes. It's fingering weight yarn, which is one of the reasons it's taking forever um, on size three needles. So I'm getting seven stitches to the inch. Um, the yarn I'm using for both sweaters is, I'm using a Cascade Heritage in plain white for the plain white color. And the hand dyed yarn is by Republica Unicornia. So the second sweater, this is the, the bigger one for the older niece. I just finished the first sleeve this morning. That's how slow this has been going. Cause I think I had maybe gotten down the sleeve and then ripped back cause it was too big. Um, and since two weeks ago or three weeks ago or whenever I last did one of these episodes, I had like basically made it to the elbow. And since then I have made it to the end of the sleeve. I have bound off the cuff. It's garter stitch cuff. I really hate knitting garter stitch in the round, like hate, hate it. So when I got to the cuff and it calls for garter stitch, I just went back and forth. And I will sew this up anyway, when I have to hide the ends. Um, I just, I would rather do that and have the garter ridges line up exactly along the seam than have that wonky thing that happens right right where you change the round or right at the beginning of the round. For some reason that bugs me. Um, and also this way I can knit more and not have to purl so much. So what's left on this, it is gonna take a while, is the second sleeve. Although that should, the sleeve should go faster since I have figured out exactly how to do the decreases. I marked them all with markers. Um, and then I need to do the hood, which will take a lot of yarn because hoods, hoods are big and this is a bigger size than the last one. And then I will have to pick up approximately a million and one stitches all the way up the front around the hood and down the other front to do a button band. But it'll get done. My goal now is to have these done for Christmas and we're not quite to November. So I've, I've got like two months or so to finish to finish that. So I'm, I'm on track, but I am ready to be done with this. The yarn is really nice. Like I said, it's Republica Unicornia. This color I'm using for the second sweater is so highly variegated. It's very fun. And it will look gorgeous on my niece who has blue eyes and cascading strawberry blonde curly hair. It will just be gorgeous on her. Um, but you know, when you get to a point where you've been working on the same project for months and months, you're just like ready to be done with it and start something fresh. Um, the other work in progress, the other knitting work in progress that I'm going to show you is a hat. I've showed this before. I thought I would be done with it by now, but I kept screwing up. That happens sometimes. I consider myself to be a very experienced knitter and I still screw up all the time and have to take things out. It's just part of the process. So this hat is called, well, it's the Batista Beanie by 
Daniel Drennan El Awar. I probably didn't say that right. Also known as Ibn Sufi Knits <clears throat> or Ibn Sufi. So here's uh, the photo from the pattern. It's so cool, don't you think? Um, this designer has many iterations of this hat design. So the vertical stripes with a diamond or, you know, a square turned on a corner motif based in Arabic letters. So this is an Arabic letter that means salam or peace. <clears throat> He just released another one. The name of it is escaping me, but it's actually, as of today, it's up on the high, hot right now in Ravelry, which is really cool um, that he's starting to get some more recognition for his work with these hats, because they're, they're good. And his instructions are very thorough, and he offers lots and lots of suggestions for what yarn to use and how to, how to deal with yarn management and all that stuff. So I haven't made a ton of progress since I last showed this. I'm not even quite done with the motif. The reason being that I took this with me on a work trip. I think I will talk about that a little bit later too. <coughs> and I just, I think I was making mistakes in the color work and I would get a couple rounds up before noticing so I would tink back. I didn't want to take it off the needles and rip back. So I had to unknit one stitch at a time all the way around. And it just is taking me a while because I keep getting sidetracked by other things. But I really like how this is turning out. And I think, I think it'll be a really nice hat when it's done. And I think I already said also last time that I want to make another one and you know, pick different colors, but make sure the darker color is the dominant color rather than the lighter one, just to see what that effect is like. So I'm using Cascade 220 Sport, which is a non-super wash wool. The colors I have are, these are showing up pretty well. This is a dark, very heathery other evergreen, and this is sort of a light tan or beige. And what's interesting about color dominance is that, so I'm holding the beige yarn in my left hand, which means that that color will be more prominent in the hat. And it kind of looks like, when you do it that way with the lighter color, it kind of looks like this green is just like a shadow. It looks very three-dimensional, um, like more dimension, more three-dimensional than, than knitted fabric ordinarily looks, in my opinion. Um, I think there's just something about vertical, vertical stripes that does that. So it's, it's pretty neat. I'm really pleased with how this is turning out and I need to finish it and start another one along with all the, you know, all the rest of my projects. Okay. I had to take a couple of minutes to catch my breath, take off that sweater because I'm actually really warm here. Um, and I realized I forgot to share a work in progress with you. So let's go back to that. I've got one more. I don't know how I could forget this because I've been working on it this week. This is another project that I mentioned wanting to make in my last episode and I did start it. So, um, I've made one of these before. I'm working on a gnome. show it to you. There it focused. Isn't that cool? This is called Here We Gnome Again. It's a pattern by Sarah Shira of Imagined Landscapes. Big fan. Big fan of her as a designer, as a person. She and her sister have a podcast together called Imagined Landscapes. It's really great. Um, and I have made one of these before. I made a gnome, made one of these gnomes in green this past spring as a birthday gift for someone. This is also a gift for someone. I don't know if it'll get done in time for their birthday next week, but if not, I can always save it for Christmas. Um, I am using, this is yarn left over from something else and I think it might be Patton's Classic Wool. I did not save the label, but it's, really hard to describe this color. It's sort of a rusty red, 
heathery color, but you know, if you looked at it real close, I think you'd see a lot of colors kind of spun into it, creating that heathered look. Um, I think it's great color for a gnome. So um, I am again doing the worsted weight yarn size. And I don't remember what needle sizes I used the first time I made this. The pattern calls for the worsted weight version, it calls for size five needles and size four needles. So you use the larger ones for the hat and the smaller ones for the body for some reason. Um, I think the first time I made this gnome, I went up on everything. So I think I used size six needles for the hat and size five for the body. And I wish I had done that for this one. Instead, I just picked up the needle size that the pattern called for. And sure enough, this hat, like, there's no stuffing in here. There's nothing in here to support this hat. It is absolutely standing straight up on its own, which I guess is okay. Although I was sort of thinking it would be fun to have, you know, the floppy gnome hat like that. Um, but at this tight gauge with those needles, it's not really gonna work. So when I was done with the hat and realized just how firm and stiff it is, I thought about redoing the whole thing and going up a needle size, but I don't wanna do that. I'd rather not start over. So it's just, it's just gonna be a very firm gnome and it's gonna have a pointy hat instead of a floppy hat and that's okay. So I have since uh, finished the hat, obviously, and picked up stitches um, under the brim to do the body. So you pick up stitches under the brim and then you knit out for the body and the beard and the arms and the nose are done separately. Or maybe the nose is part of the beard. I think the nose is a bobble on the beard. Anyway, those parts are done separately and then sewn on. Um, the pattern is really gorgeous. That's why I came back to it. It's you can see there are cables. These are twisted knit stitches, which is not my favorite thing to execute. It's a little bit slow going, but I love the look. And since it's my second time with this pattern, I think it's going a little faster. Um, knitting worsted weight yarn on size four needles for the body is not the most comfortable, but it's going to look great. So, so that's okay. So that's, that's my other work in progress, and I hope to finish it pretty soon. We'll see how much knitting time I get this weekend. I'm actually in town for the whole weekend, which helps. Okay, now I wanna get to my special topic, which is simply um, what I look for when I visit a new yarn shop. So, I feel like this is especially relevant now that we're in fall fiber festival season and the wildly popular sheep and wool festival at Rhinebeck has come and gone very recently. There were satellite events around that. Um, as I said before, Wool and Folk was an absolute disaster and was like literally traumatizing for people. Um, and there were other events that I assume went off a little more smoothly. But regardless of that, I have been thinking about shops, festivals, you know, any kind of event or place where knitters go or fiber people go and what makes them feel welcome. Why would I want to go visit a shop? So part of this is because I'm at a point in my life and my crafting life where I have more than enough supplies. I have a very large stash that I don't really need anything. If I go to visit a shop, um, it's not because I need something from there, you know, unless I need stitch markers or something like that. But like, I don't need yarn. Um, my reasons for visiting would be to see what they have, see if there's something interesting or unique that I can't find somewhere else to support a business that I think is worth supporting, all that stuff. Um, so there are different things that I look for. And I wanna say, I've had different experiences. I have been to three shops in my travels and I had mixed experiences with them. So I just thought I'd share a little bit about it. 
Um, the first place I went to, um, first, one of the first places I had, okay, so earlier this month, I was traveling to two different cities um, for work for two different events and programs that I was running. And for the second event that I was running, I was in Appleton, Wisconsin. So Appleton is um, like, here's Wisconsin and my thumb is the Door County Peninsula. Appleton is like on the way here. It's in the East Central region, kind of on your way up to Door County. And they have a really lovely downtown. And I was hanging around there, checking out the event space, kind of just getting a lay of the land because I had a little time to kill the day before this event. And I found a yarn shop and it's called Casting On. And I decided it would be worth visiting there. Now, um, I feel like a lot of times when you walk into a shop, you kind of get a vibe. <laughs> like, I know that sounds really woo, but sometimes you can just tell if a place has the right kind of energy. Um, before I even walked into this place, I could see that they had a really big inclusive pride flag hanging in the window. I can't remember if it was a big sticker or if it was like a fabric flag, but anyway, it was there in the front window. It was very prominent. And what you need to understand about Appleton, Wisconsin, or Wisconsin in general, is that outside of a couple of cities, including my home city of Madison, most other places, it's not a given that people are necessarily welcome and accepting of, um, of LGBTQ identities. So the fact that this place was very prominently expressing that I took as a good sign. And sure enough, when I walked in, I think it was the owner who was greeting me, um, who was there working, greeted me. She was extremely friendly. She told me, you know, let her know if I had any questions, all that stuff. And um, I ended up, you know, spending a fair amount of time there and looking at a lot of things. And we had a really lovely conversation. And it just, it felt like a good place. Um, the lighting was good, you know, just in the physical space, there were a couple of different places where people could sit if they wanted. Now this was the middle of the afternoon on a weekday, so I was the only person there, the only customer there. Um, but I thought it was nice that she had a couple of different seating areas. I believe there was a table with chairs kind of on one side of the shop, and then there was another area with a couch and a, another stuffed chair, like in a carpet. So it was just, cozy and welcoming and didn't feel imposing. And I did buy some yarn there, so I might as well share what I got. The first thing I got was two skeins of this yarn from Wool Dreamers. I love this red color. Um, when I was at the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival in September, I actually saw a vendor that had a lot of Wool Dreamers yarn. And I was debating about getting some, but at the time I was tired. I really didn't know how to choose what I wanted. So I, you know, went on my way and I just didn't make it back there. But this time, now that I saw it, I was a little more prepared. Um, this is fingering weight, although she said it would easily block out to more of a sport weight because this is non-superwash. It is, everything here is in Spanish and I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately. But I think it's Merino, it's minimally processed. It is from Spain. And this is my favorite color in the world, is this red, this deep kind of rich red color. So my plan is to make a vest. I want to make, I want a vest in my life and some more lightweight sweaters because everything I have is like very like warm and cozy and I need, I need more stuff for transitional seasons like this one. So that's my plan. I can, I'm trying to remember what the name, there's a vest pattern by Wool and Pine and it's, it came out not too long ago. It's V-neck, it has a cabled pattern, and I'm totally blanking on what it's 
called. But that's what I want to make with these. The other yarn I bought there, now this was a splurge, is from Ula and Leah. It's cashmere from Free Range Goats. So you can imagine why I only bought one skein. Um, there's a lot of information here on the label about its origins. It's sourced through the Sustainable Cashmere Union. Um, they source the wool or the fibers from the goats sustainably when the goats start shedding in the spring. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of good things about this brand. They had a lot of beautiful colors and it was sort of hard to choose. In fact, they had a color almost identical to the red color of the other yarn I just showed you, but I thought I should expand my palette a little bit. So I bought this one skein of this beautiful, deep, deep spruce green. It's fingering weight and it's 430 yards for 100 grams. So I will find some kind of one skein shawl or scarf pattern to make out of it. I want something kind of long and skinny, um, not, not like a deep triangle, especially for a one skein project. So I have a couple in mind, but I'll let you know when I start them. Both this and the other yarn I got, the shop owner emphasized that they change a lot. After, they are minimally processed, so they change a lot after you um, wash and block them. So to be honest, I will not swatch with this if I make a, like a lace shawl. I'll just wing it probably. But this, since I want to make a garment out of it, I will definitely swatch and wash and everything and hope that this wash doesn't lie because sometimes they do. Um, let's see. So that was one shop I visited. I forget if I said the name. It's called Casting On. They're lovely. Um, if you're ever in Appleton, Wisconsin, I highly recommend them. The next week I went to Detroit for like this three day meeting of a network of organizations that all kind of work in the same general area of climate change. And um, it was great. I had never been to Detroit before. That was a really interesting experience. It's, um, I mean, if any of you are from there or have spent time there, I'm sure you know much, you obviously know much more about it than I do, but um, I had never really quite seen a place like that where you've got some buildings um, who have clearly been revitalized and redone and cared for next to like empty lots. And I, we saw so many empty buildings, burned out buildings, um, places that had clearly been neglected and disinvested in. Um, and then also some really, really beautiful, inspiring spaces as well. So um, yeah, that was a whole experience. But I was at this three day meeting um, at a center on the edge of downtown, right on the river. And it just, you know, it just so happened coincidentally that around the corner from the place where we were meeting, like not even five minute walk away, literally the next block over, there was a yarn shop. So during one of the breaks in the afternoon, I made my way over there because I thought I have to check this out. It's called Parker Avenue. Sorry about the crinkles. Here's the bag, because yes, I bought something. Parker Avenue Knits. Um, this was hands down the friendliest yarn shop I've ever been in. Hands down. It was really lovely. I'll throw a couple of pictures in of, that I took when I came in. Um, the, the staff person who was working there was so nice, so welcoming. There were some people there knitting. Again, they had, it wasn't a very large shop. It's, it is not a very large shop, but they have seating in a couple of different places. Um, not long after, you know, you walk in and you see the counter and you see some yarn displayed and off to one side a little bit are a couple of couches where people can sit. And then there was a table and chairs in the back of the main room. And it just, there were people there knitting and clearly having a good time with each other. And it was just 
a really nice place. Um, they had a lot of nice yarn too. And the thing, I surprised myself with what I came back with. Um, I was admiring some samples that they had draped over the couch, including this shawl that had a really pretty textured stitch pattern. I'm not really into lacy things much, but this, this looked like a really comfy shawl and it had this cool stitch pattern that I assumed was slip stitches. But the staff member who came over said, oh, that's Tunisian crochet. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, I've never, I've actually never tried that, but I'm sort of curious. And she said, oh, it's just the easiest thing in the world. I can teach you in five minutes. And this lady, she's a good sales lady, because by the time I left that shop, <laughs> she had sat me down, had taught the basic stitch, I don't even remember what it's called now, had taught me the basic stitch, sold me two skeins of yarn and a crochet hook. So, and it is fun, it's very relaxing. Um, I was Tunisian crocheting my way through the next day of meetings, which, which was really nice. So this is what I have. Now I do know how to execute a regular crochet stitch. I can do a single and double crochet, like the American single and double crochet. I don't know how to follow a pattern or read a chart. That's for another time. For Tunisian crochet, I don't know how to follow a pattern or read a chart, but I know how to execute this stitch. Um, the Oh, the other cool thing, one of the reasons she was so excited to show me Tunisian crochet was that like the goddess of this craft, Tony Lipsky, is a native of Detroit, no longer lives there, but I think she has visited this shop before. They had her book. I almost bought her book, but decided maybe I should wait and see how into this I get. Um, but that was really cool. So um, the yarn I got is this tweed in two different colors. It's... King Cole, I don't know this brand. King Cole Homespun Double Knitting. This is the label. I guess I don't mind showing you the price. It was $9.50 for one skein. Doesn't want to show up. But you can see I have this beautiful soft red color and this, well, it's called mushroom, <clears throat> sort of beige color. And I have almost 30 stitches on here. I actually had to rip back because I was losing stitches. I, I think uh, that's something easy to do when you have crochet. Um, but I'm just, obviously my stripes at the bottom are different than here, but I'm just alternating the two colors. And when I'm about out of yarn, I will sew the ends together and have myself a cowl. That's what I'm going to do. It's, it's nice and soft. It's, um, what is in this yarn? It's a blend of superwash merino, alpaca, polyamide, acrylic, and viscose. So it's sort of a kitchen sink. Um, and despite the superwash merino, I don't think this is probably washable yarn, but that's okay. It's just gonna be a cowl. Um, but I'm really having fun with it. And if it doesn't look amazing, that's okay, because I'm just learning. And it'll just be something that I wear around my neck. So I could see myself potentially making um, maybe like a lap blanket or something. Um, I like that this fabric is not quite so stretchy as knitting. Um, I don't like knitted blankets very much, I have to confess. And I think it's because they tend to be very stretchy and I would rather have something that holds its shape you know, when you pick it up or put it over yourself. Anyway, so that was a great experience. I had a great experience in that shop. Now on my way home from Detroit, I drove. Um, I drove by myself on the way back and partway through I decided I needed a break from driving. I needed to, desperately needed some coffee and I found this shop not too far off the interstate in, um, maybe I won't name it. 
because it was it was not the same atmosphere at all you know how i was saying like you just get this vibe so when i stopped there um i just kind of wanted to see what they have i walked in it was like in this little strip mall that wasn't very nice but i'm not going to judge a yarn shop for the retail space they can find because you know that's that's a whole other question of where you can afford to rent and all that but i walked in the lighting was really bright and harsh right inside the front door there was this group of like six or seven people in a knitting group um which made me feel very conspicuous and kind of self-conscious when i walked in and one of them presumably whoever was working at the shop like said hello and welcome and did i need help with anything um so that was all fine but uh, you know, I said, no, thanks. I'm just passing through. I'm going to look around. And so I'm looking at their yarn selection, which was fine, not fantastic, but not anything to write home about. And I could overhear their conversation. And it just something about it just did not sit right with me. Um, you know, I couldn't really see exactly who was participating in this conversation, because like I said, there were at least five or six or seven people and there were probably only two of them talking about this particular subject but they said some very unfortunate things about unhoused people um they were talking about how they didn't like how all these outsiders were coming into their town and this place and that place and what do these people think they're doing moving in and telling us how to think and i just it just did not feel right to me it felt very exclusive and gatekeepy and just kind of icky. And after about five minutes, now look, I don't know if the shop person was participating in this conversation. I don't know anything else about these people. So I don't want to be like super judgmental, but something about it didn't sit right with me. And I decided I don't need to be here. I don't need to spend any more time here. I don't need to spend my money here. So I just quietly left. I went and got my cup of coffee and I drove the rest of the way home. Um, but you know, three very different experiences in three very different shops. And I'm happy that the first two were so positive and I was happy to spend my money in those places. So, um, I had more to share, but I actually think that I have to get to a meeting now. So I'm going to call that it for today. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.